Buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Eh, en nombre del Ministerio de Trabajo les damos la bienvenida. Estamos muy agradecidos por tenerlos acá presentes. A continuación vamos a dar comienzo al panel número uno eh, y los dejo acá con el moderador Amerigo Incalaterra. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias y buenas tardes a todos y a todas por estar reunida en este, en este panel donde vamos a tratar de profundizar en relación con eh, la problemática de la, eh, del trabajo infantil y de las mejores formas para erradicarlo. Para la oficina del alto comisionado de las Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos, al cual me honro representar en América del Sur. La problemática es, eh, sin duda alguna, eh, un tema de, de alta preocupación. El, el fenómeno del trabajo infantil en la región muchas veces está vinculado a temas de migración, de trata de personas, eh, y surge principalmente de un desconocimiento profundo de la, eh, de los, de, de la situación en sí misma. Nos faltan datos, eh, nos faltan políticas públicas eh, adecuadas eh, y principalmente tenemos un marco jurídico sí sumamente importante. Los países de la región han ratificado prácticamente todos los tratados internacionales en materia de derechos humanos y a veces el eh, análisis que hacemos es sí tenemos leyes, pero muchas veces nos falta la implementación y los problemas siguen eh, repitiéndose años tras años y por eso nos parece sumamente importante contar con este panel de lujo donde poder profundizar un poco más justamente en estos temas qué es lo que nos falta para realmente eh, sostener no solamente bajo un marco jurídico eh, de derechos humanos pero principalmente a través de medidas a través de planes, a través de institucionalidades, a través en definitiva de conocer los buenos ejemplos que los panelistas eh, nos van a compartir en breve uno de los temas principales que tenemos hoy en vista es eh, la agenda 2030 de desarrollo sostenible una agenda que nosotros decimos que es una agenda de derechos humanos que nos obliga de alguna manera en un tiempo muy corto a dar respuesta que eh, a la fecha seguimos no dando con la efectividad y con la eh, fortaleza que deberíamos dar. Eh, el panel va a consistir en una serie de, 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 de análisis que van a hacer los panelistas a partir de unas preguntas que voy a hacer a ellos. Esperamos que esta misma pregunta, de todas maneras, no se circunscriban solo a las personas que han eh, sido mencionada para responderla pero también los otros panelistas pueden complementar de acuerdo a su propio eh, eh, análisis y principalmente esperamos que haya un diálogo entre ustedes nosotros vamos a recibir una serie de preguntas que vamos a transmitirla a los panelistas para de alguna manera englobar y, eh, y discutir y ojalá eh, tener una, una profundidad en el acercamiento de este tema eh, para iniciar voy a pedirle a, al viceministro de, eh, de Trabajo de Sudáfrica, Sango Patequile Olomisa, que eh, me ha pedido unos minutos iniciales para hacer un statement de parte de, del gobierno. Uh, good morning, uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the honor given to South Africa to share our experiences in the matter of uh, the struggle for the eradication of child labor. The rule of law and good governance are one side of the same coin, while social dialogue occupies the other side. In other words, for good governance practices to be above board, invariably it must be within the ambit of the law. You cannot have the one without the other. With that said, our constitution acts as a safeguard and encompasses and represents all that is good and noble in our country. Every child has the right to be protected from exploitative labor practices, 
not to be required or permitted to perform work or provide services that are inappropriate for a person of that child's age or place at risk the child's well-being, education, physical or mental health, spiritual, moral, or social development. To have a plethora of laws informed by the Freedom Charter and our Constitution. We commemorate the National Day Against Child Labor on an annual basis to show our resolve and commitments towards this goal. The practice of child labor deprives children of their childhood, interferes with their ability to attend regular schooling, and all that is mentally, physically, socially, morally dangerous and harmful. Many children are trapped in child labor at young ages, far too often under dangerous working conditions with long hours and exposure to harmful elements. This is not only unacceptable, it is abhorrent. So how far have we gone as a country in addressing this challenge? South Africa has taken decisive steps to deal with this matter. The inclusion of the Bill of Rights as a special section on the rights of the child was an important development for South Africa's children, most of whom had suffered under apartheid for many years. Yes, children need special protection because they are among the most vulnerable members of society. They are dependent on others, their parents and families, or the state when the parents and families fail to do the, their work. The country's constitution states, among other things, that every child has the right to be protected from maltreatment, neglect, abuse, and exploitative labor practices, has the right not to be required or permitted to perform work or provide services that are inappropriate for that child's age. The Bill of Rights is not the only instrument the law uses to guard children's rights. Legal instruments that provide specific protection for children in South Africa include, but are not limited, to the Child Care Act of 1983, which makes it a criminal offense if a person who has to maintain a child doesn't provide the child with clothes, housing, and medical care. Basic Conditions of Employment Act, which makes it illegal to employ a child under the age of 18. The Domestic Violence Act of 1998, which defines different forms of domestic violence and explains how a child can get a protection order against the abuser, and the Films and Publications Act, which protects children from exploitation in child pornography. Although household chores are usually considered non-threatening by most parents and society, it may be a strong deterrent to educational activities and optimal development of a child. The guidelines on acceptable household chores developed by the Department of Labor and Social Partners ensure that that distinction is made. Key elements of the Child Labor Program of Action are targeting the implementation of government and other stakeholders' programs and policies on poverty, employment, labor, and social matters more effectively in areas where the work children do has serious negative effects on them promoting legislative measures against worst forms of child labor, strengthening of national capacity to enforce legislative measures, and increasing public awareness and social mobilization against worst forms of child labor. Our labor legislation makes provision for social dialogue through a tripartite structure. The Basic Conditions of Employment Act, which regulates child labor, was a result of social dialogue by social partners made up by representatives from government, organized business and organized labor, plus civil society. Furthermore, the implementation of the Child Labor Program of Action is coordinated by the Implementation Committee, which consists of tripartite structures, including, as I say, civil society. All government departments are included in the enforcement of child protection measures. A quarterly meeting is held by departments to monitor their progress in regards to the child labor program of action. Child labor intersectoral committees further coordinate child labor in the various uh, provinces. In conclusion, Mr. Moderator, child labor and forced labor are a criminal offense in terms of the basic conditions of employment act. Inspectors of the Department of Labor accordingly enforce child labor in collaboration with the South African Police Service and the Department of Social Development. Furthermore, Every person has a responsibility to report a child in need in terms of the child care act. I understand that there will be questions. Unfortunately, I'm not alone. 
the officials, high-ranking officials in the Department of Labor are with us. Where I am confronted with difficult questions, they will be able to take care of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and also for pointing out. And now I will turn with uh, Fernando Garcia Casas, Spain Secretary of State of International Cooperation for Latin America and Caribbean, who will speak on Spain's long-standing development assistance to state and states response to child labor. And the question that uh, I would like to pose him is, Latin America and the Caribbean have witnessed impressive declines in child labor, and Spain has supported this effort for many years. With all of the development challenges facing the region, why has Spain made tackling child labor a priority? And often, the second, maybe you can also uh, complement, it's often said that it's fine to ratify international convention against child labor, but nothing will happen unless they are actually implemented. In your experience, how important is that international standard are properly reflected in national legislation? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You will understand that being in Argentina, I couldn't be forgiven if I don't speak in Spanish. So let me allow me to transfer to my mother tongue. Eh, buenas tardes. Bueno, ¿por qué la, la cooperación española se dedicó a esto desde 1995? Pues porque desde la igualdad consideramos que somos amigos, socios y aliados de esta región. Y por tanto, eh, lo que queríamos es contribuir a la solución de algo que es un desafío principal. El eh, trabajo infantil, por desgracia, no es una, un sideline en un medio de comunicación. Y teníamos el problema inicial de la invisibilidad del trabajo infantil, porque a veces era en zonas rurales, en zonas apartadas, es intermitente, eh, con frecuencia afecta a niñas, a minorías indígenas, a, minoría, a pueblos indígenas, a minorías étnicas, a discapacitados. No es tan fácil la trazabilidad a largo plazo. Y entonces por eso quisimos empezar a, a trabajar ahí. Y había muchas cosas, desde falta de infraestructuras educativas, baja formación de los profesores, escasa inspección de trabajo, eh, la pobreza como el gran desafío y la desigualdad de la región, y porque también los países menos adelantados de la región eran quienes tenían mayores porcentajes de trabajo infantil. De modo que hay un estudio muy bueno de la Organización Iberoamericana de Seguridad Social cuya secretaria general nos acompaña, que establece cuatro fases cronológicas en la, en la protección y la lucha contra el trabajo infantil. Hasta 1973, de 1973 al 94, del 1994 al 2000 y del 2000 a la actualidad. Pues bueno, en 1994, en esa tercera fase, la cooperación española se incorpora y empieza a colaborar a petición de la Organización Internacional del Trabajo quienes hoy nos albergan aquí, junto con el gobierno argentino, y a quienes agradecemos su hospitalidad. Pero hay muy buenas noticias. La región es la que más ha reducido el trabajo infantil de todo el ámbito mundial. Y es una región que ha realizado reformas institucionales, reformas macroeconómicas, donde la democracia se ha consolidado y hay eh, buenos ejemplos, muchas prácticas de diálogo social. Entonces, bueno, pues nosotros lo que empezamos era ahí, con las, también las ratificaciones de los convenios, pero fíjense, se ha dicho hoy en la sesión inaugural, que la, lo ha dicho el secretario de la OIT, que el convenio 182 es el más ratificado de la historia de la OIT. Bien, de los convenios de Naciones Unidas, la Convención de Derechos del Niño es también la más ratificada universalmente. ¿Y cómo así entonces? que aún hay 152 millones de niños que siguen trabajando. ¿Qué está fallando entre la teoría y las convenciones jurídicas? ¿No se oye? No. No, no se escucha. No se escucha, me dicen... Me, para los traductores nos dicen que no se escucha. A la hora sí. Gracias. 
Entonces, ¿qué ha pasado si las dos un convenio de OIT y la convención más universal ratificada por Naciones Unidas tienen todavía 152 de niños trabajando? ¿Qué es lo que falla entre la teoría y la ley y la práctica? Bueno, esos son los desafíos que nos tenemos que que no se pueden esconder. Y además, porque esto del trabajo infantil tiene que ver con la educación, con la pobreza y también con el trabajo decente de los adultos. Pues bueno, empezamos en el año 95 en América Latina, en el norte de África y también en Vietnam. Y empezamos primero detectando el problema como si fuera una enfermedad. La visibilidad, la medición estadística en segundo lugar, las respuestas, la institucionalización y la creación de, de centros y de comités intersectoriales contra el trabajo infantil. Fueron unos años, valga la redundancia, de trabajo frenético. Y como estamos cerca del Río de la Plata, lo que es importante es navegar en convoy. Navegando juntos se llega más lejos, se llega más protegidos y se llega mejor. Por eso empezamos el trabajo, como también es propio de la OIT, con gobiernos, con empleadores, con organizaciones de trabajadores, con la sociedad civil y también con otros socios de la cooperación internacional, con otros países, porque lo que hay es que trabajar juntos. Y entonces tenemos las buenas medidas de que en América Latina es la región que más redujo el trabajo infantil. Y el enfoque regional, en una región que tiene muy conciencia de sí misma, fertilizó y benefició el enfoque nacional. Sin embargo, la tercera cumbre mundial, la de Brasilia, fíjense que de las cuatro cumbres de erradicación del trabajo infantil, las dos últimas han sido en América Latina. Es importante de, de notar esto para que se vea lo que la región de hoy. Bueno, pues en Brasilia se vio que se iba reduciendo la reducción, que se estaba de alguna manera estancando esas buenas medidas. Y de ahí ha salido la iniciativa regional de América Latina y Caribe libre de trabajo infantil agrupa también a empleados y trabajadores y es la que nos permitirá llegar si llegamos a cumplir la meta 8.7 para el 2025. Hay 28 países y como socios estamos la cooperación española, la cooperación brasileña y también la cooperación de la Junta de Andalucía, cuyo director también aquí nos acompaña. Eh, y donde, por cierto, nuestro premio Nobel Keitash estuvo en Sevilla la semana pasada. Bueno, ese enfoque que ha permitido un instrumento práctico diseñado por OIT con CEPAL sobre modelos de riesgo de trabajo infantil. Lo pueden ustedes ver en, el, en uno de los stands aquí fuera y ya existe en Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, México y Perú. Y es barrio por barrio, región por región, aquellos lugares que son más susceptibles de que exista trabajo infantil. Y entonces eso permite actuar. En 2018 serán 12 países más quienes se van a incorporar en una red de puntos focales con eh, gobiernos, empleadores y trabajadores, la Secretaría Técnica la ejerce la OIT y que reportan las decisiones por consenso a un grupo de alto nivel eh, eh, organizado e integrado por los ministros y ministras de trabajo. De manera que hemos pasado del histórico IPEC a esta iniciativa regional, haciendo verdad lo que es un tema actual de las agendas de desarrollo, la apropiación la ejecución por los propios países, de manera que cre creemos que se trata de una buena práctica. Y así podemos, materializando esa agenda, a ver si logramos llegar a 2025 a la fe. Y además influyen otras 35 metas. Pero permítame para terminar esta pregunta, cuando decimos en la Agenda 2030 no dejar a nadie atrás, do not leave anybody behind, pensamos que es algo propio del lenguaje de Naciones Unidas. Pues no. Es algo propio de esta región. Es una frase del Popol Vuh, el libro sagrado de los mayas. Muchísimas gracias por la presentación y también por aterrizar en modelos concretos de, eh, de análisis eh, para poder hacer frente a la situación. Eh, uno de los problemas en todas las regiones del mundo, sin duda alguna, es la ausencia de datos estadísticos y dónde se produce realmente la situación de violaciones a los derechos humanos de eh, las, eh, los menores en, 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 esa, en esa situación de vulneración en relación con su trabajo. Eh, ojalá que podamos contar con los resultados, porque eso va seguramente a inspirar eh, en otras regiones de poder aplicar los mismos esquemas. Eh, voy a continuar. Eh, now, with Irene Buenemo, 
with the state secretary for employment and integration in Sweden, and will speak about the role of social dialogue and three parties, three, three parties when it comes to the rule of law. And the question are the following. How does the Swedish government support the rule of law in countries and sectors affected by the force, by, by force and child labor? And uh, Sweden has a strong tradition in tripartism and social dialogue. How do you think that social dialogue can be used to tackle child labor and force labor? Disculpa, seguimos sin traducciones. Eh, español ahora. Ahora sí, todo. Gracias. Yes. I continue. Okay. This is about the most serious kind of violation of children who work against human rights. And just because they are so serious violation, we need a collaborative effort. Uh, Sweden is committed uh, to this goal and take action internationally and nationally. And we do that by increasing empowerment and representation, supporting the most vulnerable and excluded so they can organize themselves, strengthening legal and policy frameworks, and underline accountability. We engage with like-minded partners and we support the awareness, raising and knowledge of production. The objective of Sweden's development cooperation is to create preconditions for people living under poverty and oppression to improve their own lives. Our approach addresses equality, freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining, occupational safety and health, wage and other basic working conditions, as well as taking into account the rights of indigenous people and respect for their cultures and identities. We aim, we aim to advance indigenous women's voice and economic empowerment. During these years, Sweden is a member of the UN Security Council and we have also the honor of and privilege to serve as chair for the Security Council Working Group on Children and Armed Conflict. Sweden will in this role have the following priorities. Implementing the child and armed conflict agenda and protect the integrity of the agenda. Children's ability to make their voice heard. Children's right to education. Children's right to health, including mental health in conflicts. The link between armed conflict and child labor is a tragic fact. This includes the issue of children recruited into armed conflicts. Children recruited under the age of 18 should never be recruited or used in armed conflict. They should not take a direct action and part in hostilities, forced or not. Recruitment and the use of children in armed conflicts rob them of their future. International cooperation and exchange will also take place within the framework of Agenda 2030. It is an important starting point for both national and international work, for children and in particular for the promotion and protection of children's rights. For Sweden, it is also very important to support social partners and governments to encourage the ratification of all ILO's fundamental conventions and applying them in practice. A solid international normative framework is a vital precondition for combating child labor and forced labor. But we also need to supervise these fundamental international norms in practice. ILO itself is of course a good example of how social partners contribute to supervising if and how states implement conventions they have ratified. The labor market is undergoing heavily 
transformative changes worldwide. Technology, demography, globalization, and climate change are seen as the key drivers for change in the labor market. Looking ahead, we need to understand how these drivers will affect our societies and how to better turn them into opportunities. Social partners have a role to play in cooperating with governments to set up education system giving access to basic quality education. There are strong development uh, in the right direction when it comes to basic education, but now is the time for the next step, uh, vocational education and training and access to higher education for both boys and girls is, has to be encouraged. Access to higher education is an important driving force away from child labor. But this also requires that social partners are representative and independent, and that government respects their role, the role and autonomy of the social partners. Here we have challenges. Uh, in the form of falling trade union density in many countries and sometimes a climate where cooperation is not encouraged. These are some reasons uh, behind our P Prime Minister's launch of the Global Deal for decent work and inclusive growth, which I'm very happy that the government of Argentina and other partners are actively supporting. The Global Deal is a multi-stakeholder initiative developed in cooperation with OECD and the ILO. The focus is on the enhanced social dialogue and sound industrial relation as a means to decent work, quality jobs and increased productivity and by extension to greater equality and inclusive growth. Young people who are being exploited in the labor market who in the lack of education feels that they have lost their future are a source of political conflicts, radicalization and fundamentalism. The potential the social dialogue and South industrial relations can have for sustainable development is an area that has not gotten enough attention. In short, Global Deal has three components. One is to encourage action through voluntary commitments by the associated partners. A second is to increase the knowledge base about social dialogue. A third is to provide a platform for sharing experience and best practices to increase awareness of the benefits of social dialogues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Remy. And now, uh is the turn of the next speaker, is Gabriela Erzo. No, I'm sorry. Now, next panelist is Marina Jarbusinova, who is the OSCE Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings. She will share information on regional cooperation to eliminate forced labor and trafficking in person. And the question for her is, uh, what is the state of play of rule of law and good governance in all CCE region in terms of combating child trafficking and human trafficking for forced labor. And what are some examples of your office support to address rule of law and good governance in combating child trafficking and human trafficking for forced labor in the region of the CCE? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, first of all, let me express my gratitude to the government of Argentina and to ILO for the organization of this global conference on this very important uh, topic and uh, for the hospitality uh, rendered. Just a few words about the LC, as even the moderator uh, found it rather difficult to pronounce the abbreviation of my organization. 
OSCE's Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and it's uh, an organization of 57 uh, states from Eurasian uh, area, and it's the uh, largest regional political organization with a focus on comprehensive uh, security, and it's uh, recognized by all OSCE participating states that Trafficking in human beings is a threat to the security and is a challenge to the uh, modern uh, world. So, um, speaking about um, the um, trafficking in uh, human beings, in uh, 2003, the participating states adopted the OC Action Plan on Combating Trafficking in Human Beings, and in line with this plan, plan in 2004, the Office of the Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings was established as a, high, uh, as a mechanism for the establishment of high-level political dialogue and assistance to participating states in implementation of international and, of course, first of all, OC commitments in the area of combating trafficking in human beings. So, uh, speaking about the rule of law, of course, uh, it's recognized, the, the rule of law is recognized as fundamental to a successful anti uh, uh, human trafficking policies and action, as reflected in a number of OC uh, commitments and international uh, instruments. So, speaking about the international uh, commitments, over the past Two decades since the adoption of the UN um, Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, all 57 OC participating states became parties to the Convention and its protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in human beings, especially women and uh, children, so called Palermo uh, Protocol. All 57 um, participating states ratified the ILO Convention uh, 182, Elimination of Worst Forms of Child Labor. 56 participating states have ratified the 1930 uh, ILO Convention uh, uh, number 29 on forced labor, and 13 participating states have ratified the ILO Protocol of 2014 to the Forced Labor uh, Convention. Most states also have uh, developed national action plans and have national coordinators and national repertoires as equivalent uh, mechanisms. The rule of uh, law is uh, necessary to uh, ensure that traffic persons uh, have access to justice, including legal assistance uh, to claim compensation. Uh, but um, despite the ratification and implementation of the uh, Palermo Protocol and national legislation uh, throughout the entire OC uh, region, the criminal justice response remains weak in terms of the numbers of uh, traffickers um, uh, investigated and uh, prosecuted and uh, victims afforded uh, remedy. Two Often, uh, trafficking uh, cases, especially for uh, labor exploitation, are not qualified as such. Criminal networks are not uh, disrupted, uh, perpetrators uh, go unpunished, and uh, victims um, are not uh, identified and uh, redressed. This is evidence in the extremely uh, low uh, rate of investigations and convictions across the world um, for uh, human trafficking charges, as uh, the uh, UN uh, Global Report of 2016 show, and also the uh, uh, US uh, uh, Trafficking in Person uh, Report of 2016. Uh, uh, Speaks that um, not all uh, uh, that the um, uh, number, uh, uh, according to uh, the uh, data which was uh, available, the um, uh, number of trafficking convictions was only uh, a little bit more uh, higher than uh, 9,000. Uh, and it, of course, if we uh, compare uh, the figure of 25 uh, million. 
uh, enforced uh, uh, labor uh, worldwide, according to uh, ILO. So uh, we can see the uh, great uh, difference between uh, between the um, uh, uh, identification of uh, victims and uh, uh, identification and prosecution of uh, traffickers. So. As the uh, State Secretary just uh, before me mentioned that it's a need to supervise the implementation of the law, uh, irrespective of the fact that uh, in all our 57 participating states, the legislation uh, meets the uh, requirement or in line with the international requirements, still uh, the uh, practice uh, needs um, more maybe uh, supervision or better uh, implementation. So, and uh, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, for us, um, uh, trafficking in uh, human beings is, uh, um, uh, we, we approach it uh, first of all from the uh, point of view of human rights, so it's human rights based uh, approach and uh, we uh, call uh, for um, not just respect but uh, for assistance and uh, 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 assistance to uh, victims of uh, trafficking, for prevention of uh, uh, revictimization, uh, for application of the non-punishment uh, principle because very often in the judicial uh, practice, the cases, uh, as I uh, uh, find out when I uh, visit our states, very often the cases of uh, trafficking are qualified according uh, to um, uh, uh, the uh, legislation, qualified not as such as cases of trafficking, but as uh, uh, some other vi uh, violations of uh, the law. Uh, let's speak about, let's say, uh, prostitution or uh, documentation of fraud, which are punished uh, not so severely according to the criminal codes as uh, um, uh, trafficking. So, um, uh, your question, uh, uh, whether um, there are uh, positive examples, of course there are positive examples and uh, uh, I have such a very strong uh, instrument given by uh, participating states uh, in my mandate uh, to make country visits and to establish dialogues at the highest political uh, level and to discuss the uh, implementation and perspectives of um, the fight uh, against human trafficking. Uh, so, uh, uh, during these uh, dialogues, we uh, always try to analyze the uh, legislation and find uh, not just weak points, but also good examples which can be shared with all our participating states. So, the um, numerous trainings, conferences we uh, organize, or through the uh, projects. And just uh, uh, um, now, uh, we are uh, finalizing uh, our project on prevention of uh, trafficking in supply uh, chains with a focus on uh, prevention of uh, child. Uh, labor and as a result of this uh, project which we started last year we had um, seminars and conferences in Berlin, uh, London, Stockholm, um, uh, Astana uh, and uh, in a week uh, there will be the um, uh, final uh, seminar in Geneva and the uh, uh, briefing, uh, the briefing for the participating states uh, will take place in uh, Vienna uh, in the middle of uh, December, and uh, we are planning uh, to table a guideline, model guidelines for the participating states on uh, the uh, legislation, how uh, to make business uh, more uh, responsible and uh, accountable, and how to uh, prevent uh, trafficking in uh, supply chains. Uh, another good example is our innovative um, uh, project, uh, which we uh, started this year. It's a simulation uh, project with a uh, multi-stakeholder uh, approach, and uh, we uh, say that uh, we learn by doing actual participants uh, who 
uh, invited to the training, and we have trained already in, at about 200 uh, participants uh, from uh, ministries of uh, labor, ministries of social uh, service, uh, services, um, financial investigators, police investigators, prosecutors, uh, and uh, representatives of civil uh, society. So um, they um, uh, actually, uh, through this uh, training, uh, training in uh, five days, show how they can together uh, identify victims of trafficking in uh, very close to real life si uh, situations. Uh, uh, victims of trafficking for forced labor, including uh, minors and child uh, labor. Uh, the roles are played by the uh, actors. And um, uh, trafficking for uh, labor exploitation. Uh, so so uh, it, the uh, simulation exercise received uh, high uh, appreciation and um, uh, uh, by uh, the uh, participants, and we are actually requested to continue uh, the uh, simulation uh, next year. Uh, although our plan was only to have these three uh, trainings, but we are requested to organize one. Uh, we are doing. We are going to do this uh, in Italian for the Italian authorities in uh, at the end of January. Uh, then uh, for the. Uh, Last uh, Russian-speaking uh, community next uh, September, and uh, also in French language, maybe uh, with the uh, inclusion of our partners on the uh, Mediterranean. And speaking about uh, child labor, do I, do I have time? Yeah, and speaking about child labor, uh, we implemented a um, project in uh, Moldova uh, with a focus on. Uh, children without parental uh, care and uh, Moldova is one of the uh, countries where um, uh, after the uh, after they um, received independence many uh, women and men had to uh, go abroad looking for uh, uh, some uh, job placement and so many children were uh, left without parental care so to prevent these uh, children from being uh, trafficked. We, um, with the uh, support of uh, our uh, donors, implemented the uh, project uh, on uh, raising awareness among these uh, children. Uh, we uh, also uh, helped them uh, to uh, look into future uh, um, uh, job, uh, helping them to acquire some uh, professional uh, skills and uh, we also uh, published the uh, guidelines. Uh, and then we um, expanded the uh, results of our project with the involvement of the neighboring uh, countries, uh, uh, professionals uh, from uh, Ukraine, Belarus uh, were also engaged. And this project actually helped us to reach uh, the children uh, uh, without parental uh, care from two uh, parts of uh, Moldova. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And now, yes, I'm sorry for mistake before. And now is the turn of Gabriela Herzog, Vice President for Corporate Responsibility and Labor Affairs and U.S. Council for International Business, who will describe how employees, organizations support their members and member states on this issue. How do, uh, these are the questions, how do employee organizations support their members to prevent child labor and forced labor? And what are some of the ways that employers, organizations can support governments in putting in place strong legal frameworks? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the government of Argentina and to the International Labor Organization for organizing this important conference. I'm honored to join these panelists here and share in this important topic today. Um, as a representative of an employer association, uh, it's very clear that child labor, especially in its worst forms, is intolerable. Forced labor, including trafficking in persons, is an abhorrent practice 
and as employers, we support and are actively involved in the fight to eradicate these unacceptable practices. The key from our perspective is, as is described in SDG 16, um, uh, the key is the existence of an enabling environment. And that's the focus of the topic of this panel today, rule of law, social dialogue, and good governance. In terms of how employer associations uh, support their members to prevent child labor and forced labor, um, it begins at the very basic level with education. Awareness raising, education, the development of guides to help employer uh, association member and its member companies understand the various definitions, the various forms in which these important practices take place, the various international frameworks and also the national law contexts um, that, that set set the ground rules and the, and the framework for uh, elimination of these pra practices. So the development of guides, tools, training as well. Um, this can take the form of regional workshops, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges among the company members to work towards raising that awareness so that they are better empowered and better informed about their responsibilities and the opportunities to contribute to this global fight. Uh, we also um, through, uh, seek partnerships. Uh, partnerships are a key opportunity uh, for employer associations to engage with governments, civil society. Um, these joint initiatives uh, bring together all of the parties that have a key role to play. A good example of this is the recent uh, development which employers very much welcomed of the launch of the Alliance 8.7. Uh, we believe that uh, the way forward is indeed cooperation, uh, global political commitment, and concerted action. And we believe that all of these elements are uh, represent the potential of the Alliance 8.7 initiative that's focused on, on the targets within the SDGs working to eliminate child labor and forced labor. Global partnerships like Alliance 8.7 then can cascade down to the national levels as well. Employer organizations can help support implementation of national initiatives that are linked to some of these global initiatives. I was very pleased uh, in our conference back to receive information about an such an initiative here in Argentina, the company Network Against Child Labor in Argentina, which I'm sure we'll be hearing more about in the coming days. This is an example of a global issue and a global initiative being applied in partnership between government and business here in the national context of Argentina. And employer associations through these activities can help their member companies in the process. In terms of ways that employer organizations can support governments in putting in place strong legal frameworks, I would turn again at the global level to the opportunities and the, indeed the practice of global employer associations engaging constructively at the multilateral level where global frameworks are developed, negotiated, and uh, ratified. Um, an example of this type of uh, multilateral level engagement supporting governments uh, would be uh, the demonstrated employer support for the um, ILO protocol for, uh, for the, the protocol to the forced labor convention. In fact, employers are a main partner for the ILO's campaign. It's called the ILO 50 for Freedom campaign. So the goal is to reach at a minimum 50 governments ratifying this forced labor protocol and uh, we were very pleased to see most recently, I believe, the Netherlands ratified. So that brings us up to around, uh, we're just shy of 20, I think, uh, 18 or 19 governments. So we still have a ways to go. Uh, but employers are very much involved um, and supporting uh, this global uh, uh, priority. And another way, um, cascading again down to the national level, uh, that employers can support governments is through encouraging companies, encouraging local business associations to uh, um, support and engage constructively at the national level 
the development of effective national policies and laws. Um, this includes uh, support for the development and, and running of transparent legislatures, strong and independent judiciaries. These are key critical foundations for the rule of law and good governance, and we encourage companies uh, to engage actively, positively, and meaningfully in the development of these important frameworks. And then it's not enough just to have a good law. Then comes the critical part of the effective, effective enforcement. Um, and this is the, the, the key role for labor inspectorates, again, for, for judiciaries, for effective access to remedy, greater effective access to remedy, that is the, the key next step um, uh, to set, set forth these important um, enabling environments. This is an all hands on deck situation. If we're going to be successful in our shared fight, against child labor and forced labor around the world. Um, business has a responsibility, business has a role, and is very active and engaging. Uh, I echo the words we heard in the opening plenary today on the, the critical need for all sectors to be working together. Governments can't do it alone, business can't do it alone, civil society can't do it alone, but together, we really have a chance with goodwill and, and strong action. I agree. Enough with the words. Let's move to the action. Strong engagement on the part of all parties, I think, is going to bring us success um, and help us reach our goals. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela, for your presentation. And uh, now, uh, our last panelist, Silvana Capucho, who is an international affairs advisor of CGEIL, but you will explain exactly what this means. It's the largest trade union federation in Italy, and it's also a member of ILO governing body. And Ms. Capucho will explain how workers organizations can support in good governance in order to help and prevent child labor and forced labor. And the question are related to this. What is the role of workers' organizations in supporting good governance for the effective prevention of child labor and forced labor? How can workers complement state monitoring of labor conditions? And what are the links between the fundamental labor rights of freedom of associations and collective bargaining and the elimination of child labor and forced labor? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would say since the beginning that uh, uh, since their origin, since the 19th century, trade unions have played a fundamental role for the eradication of child labor and of forced labor. And then that uh, it is not an opinion, but it is a fact that uh, the freedom of association is a precondition for the democracy and for other human rights. Uh, many data show a widespread evidence that neither forced labor or child labor do exist where the freedom of association is recognized, where workers are organized, and where collective bargaining do exist. We are here to uh, discuss about uh, how to ensure the respect of the rule of law. And uh, uh, first, uh, as uh, already it was also underlined by my colleague from the employer's organization, uh, this does imply a strong, consistent monitoring at national level, but at international level as well. So it is important to uh, put the stress on the labor inspection, but on all the forms of possible monitoring, beginning from also the supervisory mechanisms as the ILO standards supervisory mechanisms, which must be strengthened in order to ensure this rule of law. Um, so, 
when we talk uh, about uh, the promotion of the fundamental principles of rights at work and of international labor standards, we have to look at all of this, uh, this framework. What we, we have to say, uh, uh, just looking at uh, the, the global situation, is that we find uh, more um, Mm -hmm. children at work, more situation of forced labor, where there are also weaker public uh, support services and the public uh, system in general working, where there are less investments on education, on health, which are a strong ingredients for uh, the emancipation of, uh, of everybody. So, one uh, major demand from the trade unions is a demand for free, universal and quality public services, which are really powerful tools against forced labor and child labor. And then in terms of a fight against the inequalities, we see that most of the failures today of the international community, but also of our um, of, of, also in our countries to fight against the crisis, against the, the difficult situations of the world of labor, uh, is linked to the existing and even increasing inequalities. Um, when we, we think about inequalities, we have to think that uh, if we fight against poverty, we fight against child labor and forced labor, but we have to look at the differences. I want here to, to, to quote uh, uh, Don Lorenzo Milani, who was uh, uh, an historical educator for poor in a specific region of uh, Tuscany, Italy, who was saying that nothing is more unjust than to share equally among unequal people, what is exactly happening now. So, uh, and uh, when we look at the different situation and looking at uh, who is the most uh, needed, we have to consider also the gender differences, uh, which is uh, especially important looking at the situation and the numbers and of uh, uh, the concentration of uh, uh, children at work and of forced labor. Uh, we can take many examples, but it's just sufficient to think about agriculture or about the domestic service also, where not only many women work in a situation of illegal uh, work, but many children with a big violation also of their condition and of their future and development. Uh, this is valid for all the informal work, which we know still uh, concerns the two-thirds of uh, the world population and uh, the majority of uh, the schooling dropout, which again has uh, a majority of, of girls leaving, leaving the school. Um, what, uh, what uh, um, then uh, I would like to say is that when we talk about uh, forced labor and, uh, uh, and about uh, children at work, um, it, it happens very often, especially in the international uh, uh, conferences, that uh, we think about uh, the, um, uh, we could say, the poorest countries or just the, 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 or the south of the world. This is something concerning all of the world and that nobody can think to be um, not, uh, uh, not interested uh, by this uh, phenomenon. Uh, looking at the European Union, the European Union, although there are perhaps there are signs of uh, uh, betterment in the economy in uh, some situation, in some limited situations, uh, nonetheless, uh, it is clear that uh, poverty is not uh, declining and when we talk about poverty, again, there is uh, uh, a group of the most vulnerable uh, people who are the children and especially the children uh, in the most disadvantaged uh, situations, I think, to the migrants, I think, to uh, the children from the refugees uh, or uh, the Roma children. 
well, the dropout is again uh, in the majority. Well, I have uh, uh, listened to our moderator uh, inviting us also to give some positive examples in his introduction. And I would like to take a uh, uh, few examples also from uh, my country, not just to say that there are examples which are better, no, but because there are examples of actions which were pushed and led by trade unions and which uh, have produced a result in terms of laws. Uh, one is in the fight against, uh, against forced labor. We have a law that is called the law on caporalato. Sorry, I am not able to translate because there is not a translation. But the caporalato is a sort of gangmaster system working especially in agriculture where there is an um, illegal hiring of workers out of any, any, any rule. So this phenomenon was concentrated especially in the south of Italy and it was related to migrant people, so I would say with a double, tribal and more in terms of exploitation. It was uh, especially um, intolerable. Uh, the, the law uh, was a law uh, strongly demanded and supported by the trade unions, and it has a lot of implication. I have not here the time of uh, uh, presenting it, but it has also an anti-trafficking fund, the, which is extended to the victims and acknowledging that the victim of trafficking is also victim of the exploitation. Then uh, um, a second example is very recent law, uh, is a law which was uh, uh, approved in, uh, in May and is a law for uh, the uh, minors arriving to Italy from uh, um, uh, uh, as refugees, but unaccompanied, uh, so uh, without uh, parents. Well, there is a law which states simply that uh, these minors have the same rights of the Italian children. Finally, this is uh, is simple, is uh, uh, a statement of civilization, but we needed a law just to say this, that all the minors are equal when they arrive to Italy. And uh, another principle which unfortunately is valid only for minors is that it is not possible to refuse to um, uh, if you say to reject any minor, so the minors must be welcome to the country. Now there is, uh, and this is my third and last example, is there is a debate which has not uh, still got uh, uh, an exit, which is uh, on the law on the use solely. Uh, which is uh, related again to the children because uh, it's the law according to which uh, we want uh, uh, the, the children who, has, who have studied in Italy or uh, who have arrived uh, in, in Italy and stayed at a certain condition and so on it, to have the Italian citizenship, so to, to, to be considered Italian. And in the reality, well, apart from the, the discussion at the legislative level and blah, 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 the reality is that in Italy uh, there are 800,000 children who are Italian. Their parents are not Italian, but they are exactly Italian. They speak Italian exactly uh, as the other children, and they have an Italian culture, and they are... Uh, they, they are all together with the others, but they cannot be considered Italian because of just of the normative, uh, the normative uh, rules. So this is, uh, there is a big debate and it is uh, a pre-electoral debate, so it's especially, uh, I could say, heavy, but uh, we shall push and we shall not give up on, on this. Um, I would like to talk about the, the social dialogue and the negotiation. I know that there are perhaps uh, problems of timing, so can I? Uh, because, uh, the, the, well, because uh, when we talk about uh, the uh, freedom of association as precondition for uh, 
uh, I would say for the democracy is also about the consensus of, on uh, how to build uh, a world uh, free from exploitation and uh, fr free from uh, uh, human rights violations. So the social dialogue is uh, uh, a main, a main uh, uh, field. So we welcome the global deal to which uh, uh, Madame Irene from Sweden, uh, the ministry, made reference. And sorry, madam, if I call you with your name and not the surname, but it's much easier. So sorry for this. Um, well, uh, we can talk about social dialogue at, at the different levels. International levels, if we think about the, the global supply chains, there is a big debate, and the ILO is giving a great contribution in this and uh, on the possibility of getting some multinational framework agreement where the international labor standards and the, the, um, and the, the fundamental rights at work are translated into practice and to protection of the workers, the men, men and women concretely. Uh, then the trade unions can play uh, and, and Indeed, they do play uh, a main role also by claiming and supporting employment policies for creating, uh, for the creation of new quality jobs by public and private investments. So, if you fight poverty, you fight exploitation, you fight child labor, you fight force labor and you build a better society in terms of quality jobs and uh, emancipation of, of, of the people. At the national level also with the possible sector agreements where you have a very concrete practical tool against the inequalities because uh, by a national agreement of sector you have um, a, a, a common base for the negotiation of wages and working conditions. So again, another tool to fight against poverty. And also by bargaining at the national, at the, at the local level, also with the municipalities, with the public authorities in terms of getting um, clearly uh, the free access to public water, to uh, have assistance for health, to have assistance for single mothers, uh, to have uh, the, the children care and uh, all, all these uh, agreements uh, are backed uh, by, by the producers. So um, I, I would like to uh, go on with other examples, but I think that now it's the case to give the floor to, uh, to the people here. And that is, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all the presentation from the panelists. Now we have some questions by the public. And uh, uh, I have a question for Sango Patekile Polomista. Uh, and the question is, could you please share with us how we increase public awareness to achieve the eradication of child labor? Well, the first step is to you make use of the mechanism of social dialogue. Because uh, if we use our partners, social partners, labor, employers, and uh, civil society, then we are in a position to cover all bases uh, to ensure that families, communities, uh, places of work are made aware, first of all, of the fact that the child labor itself is a violation of the law, is a violation of human rights of the child, is against the development uh, and growth of a child. So the best way is to use, as I say, the mechanism of social dialogue, because in that way you cover all bases. No one can say I was not aware. Thank you very much. Now I guess also I have a question for Madina Jalubisun now. And is, uh, do you train care providers for those people who are victims of tra trafficking? And 
how are the victim in Helen? I mentioned the uh, simulation training exercise we've been uh, conducting uh, since um, uh, this uh, beginning of this uh, year in Vicenza in Italy, and I mentioned that uh, we uh, have applied the multi-stakeholder approach to the organization of this uh, training exercise. So. Uh, Service providers are among those uh, who uh, are trained at this uh, simulation exercise. So they are actually uh, given the opportunity to work together with the uh, representatives of other um, agencies uh, who are mandated to uh, uh, identify victims of uh, trafficking, to assist victims of trafficking, and those who are to identify traffickers and bring them uh, to uh, criminal uh, justice. And um, uh, the uh, <laughs> simulation uh, uh, exercises uh, have shown that actually in the simulated uh, situations, all uh, these multi-professional teams are able in a very short uh, given uh, time uh, to um, uh, meet the uh, requirements and to reach the goals. Thank you. I have some questions for all the panelists, so I will read and uh, ask for any of you that would like to answer. Um, and are the following. Uh, why do you think it's crucial that other partners join in the struggle to eliminate child labor? The other is how important is the judiciary branch in ensuring compliance with child labor standards? Some of you would like to answer? Yes. de los convenios 
de la OIT como el representante del sector público. Los convenios de la OIT cambian en cada país procesos, políticas y leyes. Y se lo digo por representar a un país que ha ratificado el más alto número 133 de los convenios. Pero no es solo eso, la práctica latinoamericana, y nos acompaña también aquí el secretario de la Organización Iberoamericana de la Juventud, es que cuando se produce un convenio y se ratifica, hay toda una serie de normas nacionales que empiezan. Ha sucedido en América Latina. Fíjense, hay leyes de protección integral y códigos de la infancia vigentes. La más eh, antigua, digamos antigua, la de Cuba de 1978 y la más reciente, la de Venezuela de 2007. Todos los países tienen leyes de protección de la infancia. Y esas leyes, es decir, es el convenio, las leyes y luego los programas. Pues fíjense los nombres de la defensa de la minoridad y del trabajo infantil. Primeros años en Argentina. Chile crece contigo en Chile. De cero a siempre en Colombia, de la calle a la vida en México y en Ecuador el acompañamiento a lo largo de la vida. Esto es lo que produce, pero entonces cuando llegan a las sociedades nacionales, pongo un ejemplo, el último protocolo que hemos ratificado es el del trabajo forzoso. Como todos los convenios de la OIT, establece una, una comisión y se ha establecido por el Ministerio de Empleo y Seguridad Social y el Ministerio del Interior, y tiene que ver con lo que decía antes Gabriela Gerzo, qué problemas tenemos, el trabajo infantil desapareció en España hace 50 años, hace más de medio siglo, había un problema ahí. Pero ahora hay problemas de fraude a la seguridad social o de trabajo infantil asociado a cuestiones de migración irregular. Bueno, pues eso hay que trabajar y hay que verlo. Entonces, eh, cuando esto ocurre, están también la firma del convenio, pero están las memorias. Las memorias que cada Estado miembro tiene que presentar al comité de expertos en aplicar los convenios y recomendaciones. Es decir, hay un control ex ante y un control ex post. Y respecto a lo que decía mi colega sueca, yo creo que es muy importante. Por un lado, ratificación es solo el punto de partida, only the beginning. Luego son las, la legislación nacional, las instituciones, el control judicial y finalmente, finalmente la práctica cotidiana a lo largo de la vida. Si no implicamos a todas nuestras sociedades, el trabajo infantil no será erradicado. Sí. Yes, I have also a question for you. This is from my part. Uh, as you know, United Nations is working with enterprise since a lot of years ago, and uh, since the appointment of the special reporter uh, John Raggi, he established a set of principles, UN principles of, uh, for enterprise and business. And the question is how, from the uh, private sector, you introduce uh, this guiding principle and how you have to um, maybe how to enforce this principle in order to make the, this principle really a, a, an effective way to respect human rights for enterprises. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I may take an extra moment just to touch, I, I want to get to that important question and um, also to touch on one of the previous questions about why is it crucial for each social partner, business, government, civil society, worker, employers, and broader civil society, to join in this work, this fight against child labor and forced labor? I think I would begin with the fact that before we were employers, workers, uh, governments, we're, we're individuals, right? I'm a daughter, I'm a mother, we're sisters, we're brothers, We heard about this so passionately this morning about the fact that it has to be all of our jobs, no matter what hat we're wearing, government or employee, it has to be all of our jobs to recognize the critical need to work and do everything we can, not yesterday, now, now and in the future to eradicate the unacceptable conditions of child labor and forced labor that are present in the in the in the world today. And so so I begin there and then return to this notion that uh, workers and civil society for example sometimes they don't have the resources to take on this task themselves. They need the partners, the social partners, 
governments uh, cannot do this job themselves. If what good is it if they if they write the laws if if employers if workers are not following and employers. You know, a, a colleague has said it so well. You know, she said about her company. She said, you know, we are not the police inspector. We are not the police cop. This is, we have roles, and to get to John Ruggie, right? He he so thoughtfully was able to break down the the duty of the state under international law to protect the human rights of citizens, the responsibilities of business to respect by by operating with due diligence. That means being thoughtful. That means being doing the analysis, doing the evaluation on not just how my things around your workplace create a risk to you. No, how what you're doing in communities and working around the world may have an adverse impact on, the, on, on stakeholders and on their human rights. And then we had a question about the importance of the judiciary. Pillar three of the guiding principles is access to remedy. The need for greater access to resolution, to, to restitution for victims of alleged human rights abuse related to corporations. And so how do we introduce the UN guiding principles? Um, it, through, again, awareness raising and training, but this is something that um, many companies, many employer organizations are working on on a daily basis. They're reporting on it transparently through public reporting. They're being asked about it by investors, and so they're responding in that way. Um, it's not just a matter of one time a year at the annual forum on business and human rights in Geneva. It's every day. And, um, and, we're, and we're, we're very involved um, and very proud of the work that employers are doing. But uh, it's, 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 it's all hands on deck. This is a U.S. phrase. It's kind of like every paddle needs to be in the water. I mean, every actor needs to be involved. And we look forward to partnering with those here and beyond. Now, uh, Gabriela, do you want to Yes, but I also have something, a question for you. How you would, could be your advice in terms of how to integrate union decision in uh, making processes? Okay. Now, how you integrate the union in the process of uh, making uh, decision?
which are uh, wrong political choices which must be opposed because it is because of those choices that then exploitation and the other situation follows. So uh, there is a, a daily commitment which is demanded in order to uh, um, overcome uh, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these situations. And then it is like if we look at what happened in the last 10 years in, in Europe again with the austerity measures. If the public services were cut, the, uh, the consequence was that there was an increase in some areas of the schooling dropout. Take the case of Greece, of Portugal, of the south of Italy. This was the reality. So then you create a fertile field also for situations where children, rather than going to school, they go to, 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 to work, always in, in, in hidden situations and so on. Um, uh, how trade unions can be involved? Um, it could be also the uh, proposal of the law. Uh, recently, uh, in Italy, uh, as a CJL, we have gathered 1,500,000 of signatures of uh, uh, the Italian citizen uh, for a proposal of its uh, 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 Iniziativa di Legge Popolare. Eh? Is, uh, and it, it, it was for uh, uh, a proposal on uh, a universal labor rights, again, uh, after the, the change on the labor market which were done. But uh, also if we look at the past, uh, we had uh, some examples uh, uh, in the past of uh, um, facing some uh, periods of, of the history in, in crisis where uh, there was a national negotiation to um, agree on some uh, uh, political measures for the, the economic and social uh, social situation. This uh, does not happen always. Uh, we know that there are governments which are more open to the social dialogue and the government which are close to this. But uh, this uh, push and this uh, um, the, this pressure uh, in, in, uh, in terms of the demands and of the representations, then the, the difference amongst the, the trade unions and the civil society with uh, which the, the NGOs with uh, which we work very well, but the difference is exactly this, that uh, trade unions have a mandate to which they have to respond to workers, because workers are members of trade unions and they uh, give a mandate in terms of representation of their needs and their interests. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, it's well and good for us to say child labor must be outlawed. That is a criminal offense uh, to subject a child to, to labor, which is uh, not suitable for him. But we also need to aim to identify the causes of child labor. Why it is that uh, children find themselves having to do work? Why families allow their children to go into work? Uh, in my country, South Africa, we have a problem of unemployment, of course, and a pro problem of poverty. Then uh, the intersectoral committees that we have in order to ensure the enforcement and implementation of the child labor program. Uh, and shows that we are able to identify. For instance, the family might say, well, we don't have an income, and uh, allowing this child to go and do some work enables us now to have some money. So one of the ways of addressing that is to ensure that the children are eligible for getting social assistance, social in terms of social security, they get it. Then they will say, no, we can't take the children to school because they are hungry. And then there's a school nutritional program so that people, children are encouraged. They want, they look forward to going to school because they will be escaping from the hunger and starvation that they are suffering at home. 
If the family said, for instance, we don't have transport to take the children to school, it becomes the responsibility again of government, Department of Transport, to provide transport for the children. So what I'm saying, therefore, in other ways, that let us also look at the causes uh, of child labor and uh, seek to eliminate them in an effective and meaningful way. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todos los panelistas por ahora. Abrimos un espacio para las preguntas del público. Le que pedimos que sean, eh, tenemos algunos minutos, así que los aprovecharemos. Eh, que sean preguntas directas, eh, no queremos que sean statement, o sea, pronunciamiento. Eh, vamos a tomar un par. Aquí hay una señora, dos, tres. Vamos a tres y después. ¿Quién tiene los micrófonos? Ahí está. Sí, de Guatemala. Eh, de los trabajadores. Eh, una pregunta directamente para eh, la de responsabilidad social empresarial uh, y eh, también para los gobiernos en general. ¿Hasta cuándo vamos a entender que la situación, eh, estamos hablando de eh, es que hay que compartir empleadores, hay que compartir eh, con los trabajadores y los gobiernos? Pero me refiero principalmente a la de responsabilidad social, a la señora Gersot, porque ella dice que los trabajadores también tenemos que ir poniendo nuestra parte. Yo he visto que en esta lucha contra el trabajo infantil, los trabajadores los que hemos puesto son víctimas. Y de donde yo vengo, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, estamos teniendo un problema donde esto se volvió un monstruo incontrolable con las pandillas. Las pandillas y el trabajo migrante de niños. Entonces esto ha sido falta de una propuesta de gobiernos y una propuesta de los empleadores que están empleando también niños. Entonces quisiera yo que puntualmente se respondiera esto de parte de los gobiernos. De Guatemala, no sé si vino alguien del gobierno representándonos. Si vino, no nos informaron quién era. Y esta falta de desinformación es la que no nos hace avanzar, como bien lo decía la Biblia Maya. Gracias. Muy bien, por favor, vamos a acumular un par de preguntas más. Ahí tiene. Eh, buenas tardes, eh, ingeniería es Alzante de de Colombia, Central Unitaria de Trabajadores Corto. Eh, bueno, yo solo... Eh, con preguntarles que yo vengo de un país que acaba de eh, firmar un acuerdo para la terminación de un conflicto pero con bastantes dificultades de desigualdad y en ese sentido todavía vemos muy incierta la implementación de acuerdos como la erradicación del trabajo infantil especialmente en la zona rural yo sí preguntaría cuáles estrategias son esenciales para un país que apenas firma un conflicto y que todavía no tiene estrategias de implementación claras para ello. Sí. ¿Ya está? ¿Puedo hablar? Una última pregunta eh, para eh, la representante de Suecia. Eh, coincido y enfatizo la importancia del diálogo tripartito. Sin embargo, me pregunto, y es una invitación tal vez para el resto del panel, cómo se representan eh, aquellos sectores eh, trabajadores que están precisamente fragmentados y no acceden a la posibilidad de una representación gremial. Para el caso de la Argentina, y es eh, parte de mi trabajo y de mi investigación, los trabajadores textiles, eh, el 70% de ellos, no tienen acceso a algún, ningún tipo de representación gremial y muchas veces la representación que se puede hacer a través de organizaciones de la sociedad civil no los representan en el sentido eh, tal vez más político. Entonces la pregunta es, por esas representaciones ausentes, la figura misma del de trabajo esclavo evoca una eh, dificultad en términos de representación la lucha histórica de la eh, emancipación de los esclavos ha sido la lucha por la autorrepresentación. Esa es mi pregunta. ¿Cómo representar a aquellos que no acceden a la representación? Gracias. 
Aquí la última pregunta por ahora. Sí, primero un comentario al, al que intervino recién. Me gustaría con el, eh, desde el sector sindical eh, que a la salida podamos, podamos intercambiar porque creo que tiene una falta de información importante. Eh, la pregunta es a todo el panel, a todo el panel. Eh, coincidimos filosóficamente con lo que acá se ha planteado y creo que todos estamos por la erradicación del trabajo infantil. Ahora, ¿cómo se garantiza la erradicación del trabajo infantil en un contexto de retroceso de los derechos de los trabajadores y de los derechos humanos, que es una tendencia no solamente en nuestros países de América Latina? Esta es la primera, la, la, es una reflexión, pero también si ustedes tienen algo que decir sobre esto. En este retroceso del Estado de Derecho, ¿cómo hacemos para erradicar el trabajo infantil y cumplir con la Agenda 2030? La segunda cuestión, eh, si ustedes entienden que cualquier política de erradicación del trabajo infantil debe incluir otras políticas que eh, pongan límite al capital financiero, que ponga el límite a eh, los sectores patronales, abusadores y que se abusan de la, a veces de la debilidad de los trabajadores. Y en el ámbito rural, si ¿sí creen que se puede arrancar el trabajo infantil cuando persiste el trabajo a destajo. Muy bien, gracias. Eh, tenemos unos minutos para eh, que los panelistas puedan contestar en base a cómo al tiempo vamos a hacer otra rueda más. Empezamos de este lado. Sí. Thank you very much. I will start to, to answer the question about uh, the possibilities for some groups to, to organize themselves. And of course there are big differences. But I really think it's a very important part of the work of, of international organization, but also on the national level, to encourage all different parts at the labor market to, and give the possibilities to organize themselves. But of course, there are differences. You can see even in Sweden, with a rather high organization uh, degree, the private service sector is much less organized than the big industries and, and professionals uh, like teachers, for example, that are very highly organized. And then I think it's very important that the trade union confederations don't just don't talk about the strong groups, but also talk for the weaker groups at the labor market that has much less possibility to organize themselves. And that's, I think it's very important. So we, I mean, there are big problems in if we have insiders with strong trade unions and outsiders in the informal sector, that's a big problem for a lot of countries which we have to deal with. The other question is about migrant workers. And, um, uh, in Sweden we don't have any big problem with child labor, uh, but we can see that forced labor among migrant workers is really, even in Sweden, an increasing problem because they, they have a much uh, weaker rights on the, labor, on the labor market and they often don't want to be found by the, the authorities. So the authorities can't help them because then they are, have to leave the country. And I think migrant workers and child labor about uh, migrants is really an increasing problem when we have a lot of, of migrants in all different countries. And I really I think this is a group that has to be focused on power. Uh, child lover among migrants. Thanks. Marina, do you reply? Well, although there were no questions uh, directly to me, but I want to uh, emphasize that OC is a political organization, so we work mainly with the government. But uh, in our dialogue with the government, we always encourage the government uh, to uh, give more access to uh, civil society organizations all these uh, uh, 
combating trafficking in uh, human being uh, human beings activities and uh, we uh, through our project on prevention of trafficking in supply chains we also encourage the government to uh, closely work uh, with businesses and um, trade uh, unions uh, in uh, prevention of uh, this uh, type of uh, crime and uh, we uh, always emphasize the importance of partnerships of partnerships in a given uh, state uh, partnership among the states partnership with international uh, organizations and uh, uh, we are not only encouraging this but uh, we, are, uh, we have created the uh, platform uh, in our organization the alliance against trafficking of human beings it has uh, 38 stakeholders as uh, our uh, partner, uh, partners and these are different uh, organizations including non-government organizations, trade uh, unions, some sub-regional uh, organizations. So uh, I uh, want to echo which was uh, uh, several times mentioned at the uh, opening in the recession and uh, the day uh, Gabriel emphasized it, that no single actor uh, can um, win the battle against trafficking in uh, human beings. So uh, uh, we should uh, work in close uh, partnership and cooperation. Muchas gracias por responder al señor de Guatemala. Es verdad que la situación en el Triángulo Norte de Centroamérica, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, es un severo problema de seguridad y los avances que se han producido en México y Colombia están generando un efecto globo donde los jóvenes son los más perjudicados a veces. Colombia, la guerra, prevención, protección, reparación de todo lo que ha sucedido y en ese sentido una cosa muy importante es la escuela. La escuela lo es en toda la región y muchos países contra el trabajo infantil lo mejor es la escuela, el método más eficaz. Pero incluso si la escuela es gratuita, la ropa o uniforme, los sueldos extraoficiales a los maestros, la alimentación, el transporte, los libros y el material escolar hacen que muchas familias pobres aún no puedan alcanzar. De ahí una buena práctica que tiene esta región, que son los programas de transferencias condicionadas. Llámese el famesero, el familia, el oportunidades, el Juancito Pinto. Es modos de enganchar, de retener a los chicos en la escuela y que al menos tengan una comida nutritiva al día. Y respecto a la señora, es evidente que la, yo creo que la región también necesita una inversión digna, decente y responsable. Y hay empresas ahora que están aliadas con ONGs, miren el programa por los niños, miren el programa Luces para Aprender. Lo que tenemos que hacer es generar más prosperidad y redistribuirla más y ser más inclusivos y combatir la desigualdad. Pero también son un elemento a tener en cuenta. Regarding the inability of some workers to be represented in decision-making forums, I think it's important that people become organized. Nobody is going to organize you for yourself. If uh, your interests, your rights are being violated, it's incumbent upon you as a group, as individuals, uh, to join forces. The uh, fragmentation of unions uh, is uh, the enemy of the working uh, uh, people themselves because uh, then your voice is meaningless, is weak, and therefore nobody takes you seriously. But in instances then again where you say there's repression generally, repression uh, in the form of gangs and such like, then it becomes the responsibility indeed of the state to ensure that it protects citizens. Organizations, I mean forums organized by or provided by organizations like ILO are there in order to, to report uh, such violations. Uh, I know that uh, the ILO uh, does what uh, I would call a peer review in the sense that uh, whenever there are reported violations of the conventions, then the country uh, concerned is brought uh, to book, is required to answer and it loses certain rights and privileges as a member of the organization. So there are many ways that uh, we can use in order to apply the necessary pressure on regimes and governments and uh, I think uh, much has been said, but I would just join uh, uh, the 
Honorable Deputy Minister of Holomisa in South Africa in, in underscoring uh, the importance of, of raising voices, of, of transparency, of the use of technology to bring to light the practices that we're all working so hard to eliminate. Um, the question was, what can be the role of trade unions in challenging scenarios, such as dealing with gang warfare in Guatemala? Uh, again, I'm recognizing the dangerousness of that situation or the conflict zone, recent conflict zone in, in Colombia. The role of civil society is to help identify and shine the light and bring to all of our collective awareness what is happening, right, and bring that forward so that it can be uh, recognized and the solutions, uh, the joint solutions can begin to um, be identified. The challenges we've heard uh, over the course of the day is that many of these practices are in the shadows, the child labor, the forced labor. Much of this is found in the informal sector, which is not covered by what we were talking about here today, the rule of law, right, the laws of judiciary. So um, here is a clear role for business to advocate, civil society to advocate, and government to act, to provide incentives, to bring those small, small uh, businesses, small employers into the formal economy where they will then be covered by these laws. This, the solution, when, it's, when we're looking at the employer sector, it cannot just be to focus on the big multinationals. It has to be every workplace, every employer, every size, every sector involved in, um, in this joint fight. Um, and, and I would also align myself with the comments on uh, working to identify the root causes as the Deputy Minister from uh, South Africa mentioned earlier, thinking to understand why are these practices happening. Again, we've heard um, that the informality that's prevalent, not just in this region, but in many parts of the world, is, is a big challenge, and there's a lot of focus on the part of the ILO and national governments on strategies, but we need more attention. Well, just uh, uh, to reference, because many things were said, but one was uh, uh, related to the question of uh, the, the friend who was uh, asking about the textile workers. Indeed, uh, um, well, the situation of the textile workers is uh, especially difficult uh, everywhere. It, it was uh, always, uh, because it's one of uh, the uh, worst paid and the worst protected sectors, but now uh, we see that, uh, especially in this continent, there are uh, the export processing zones where uh, employers can uh, have access free from taxes and uh, sometimes from trade unions. So, indeed, the reality is that workers are not protected and not protected by laws in the export processing zones. And so, we should here recall another concept which was not about till now, that is the political coherence, because if we talk about the eradication of child labor and all of the rest of it is of primary importance, but this should be done in coherence. If at the same time the governments, the same governments which say that they want a world free from labor exploitation and from working children, at the same time they created the free trade zones free from the rule of law, this is a real problem. Uh, ok, I, I stop here. <laughs> bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, no ha sido realmente un panel eh, donde hemos escuchado eh, buenas experiencias y también donde están y siguen estando los desafíos. Eh, un, uno de los más importantes realmente que surge de esta discusión de esta tarde es que si queremos llegar al 2030 
con ese lema de no dejar nadie atrás, eh, realmente tenemos que eh, acelerar los tiempos y acelerar eh, las eh, decisiones que a nivel tanto de gobierno como de sociedad civil, como de sindicato, de empresa, tenemos eh, la responsabilidad de avanzar. Es evidente que la respuesta no la tiene uno solo, que todos tenemos que trabajar en forma conjunta y uno de los principales elementos es saber escuchar y abrir las puertas para el diálogo de todos los actores. Muchas gracias por esta presencia, un fuerte aplauso a los panelistas, muchísimas gracias.